if you get lost or you want to go back to it, you're more than welcome to. Um, I just want you guys to know that these viewpoints are completely my own, uh, not those of my Shire or the Kingdom or the BOD or any officials or officers. Um, they do not replace or bypass any stated policies of the SCA. I have some experience in this in the fact that I work for a military dining facility and have been for the past four years. And that is where I am getting my official health and food safety information from. And then I have been in the SCA since I was 13, and that is how I am kind of meshing the two of them together. And we have today's class. Um, this class is not intended on how, as how to set up a, and run a water bearing station, but more so on using proper techniques for sick sanitizing and food safety and this is geared more towards a smaller event as opposed to a war. I have not personally run water bearing at a war. I do not want that job. That seems like it would be way too much work but uh, yeah this is for a smaller tournament regular event and I would really like to thank Mistress Elsa and Baroness Zubeda for giving me their assistance and their opinions in developing this class. So water bearing, you know, for as long as we have had the society, we have had water bearers, people who are coming around with squirt bottles of Gatorade or water or lemonade, pickle juice, <clears throat> secangibin, uh, treats with oranges and pickles and Chex Mix. And We've needed these people and these volunteers to keep our fighters and our populace going, especially here in Onsteora where the summers are so hot and it just drains you of all energy. But now we're looking at this old practice with a new viewpoint and a new eye to ensure the health and safety of everyone involved. Our old ways of doing things are not going to be feasible with the introduction of the coronavirus into our lives. It's just too easily transmitted and we are going to have to change how we look at food safety and how we've been doing things all along. The first thing is hygiene. That is critically important more important than we've ever given any kind of consideration to before. Before you could maybe wash your hands, run up to the water bearing station, grab a bowl of pickles and go volunteer. That is not something that we're going to be able to do anymore. And our old method of passing squirt bottles from fighter to fighter, again, not something we're going to be able to continue. Um, the coronavirus is transmitted through droplets as we breathe and the squirt bottles are right there in your mouth and cr the cross contamination is just too too much um, and we're going to have to stop with reaching into a bowl for a pickle or an orange slice or grabbing a couple of olives we're not going to be able to do that anymore this is a problem that we're going to have to attack from multiple fronts. We're going to have to have event stewards working closely with their water bearing volunteers to make sure that they have everything that they need, that their proper equipment is available and used correctly. We're going to need the marshals and the fighters to become more involved in water bearing for themselves to be responsible to and for each other and make sure and remind everybody to visit the water bearing stations frequently for drinks and refreshments. Um, we're going to have to become our brother's keeper to some extent in this. The first topic, of course, is hygiene. As the leader of the water bearing station, master and mistress of the water bearing station, it is your job to make sure that all of the foods and drinks you serve are made as safe as possible. Hand washing is number one. Having clean hands when preparing for water bearing foods or drinks is an absolute necessity. 
20 seconds, soap and water, sing your favorite bardic song while you're doing it, but you've got to have your cl hands clean whenever you are doing water bearing now. When you're preparing for water bearing, you have to have a sanitary place to prepare the foods. You need to be frequently cleaning and sanitizing your counter space and any tools or dishes that you'll be using for your supplies. That means that as the water bearing charge, you're going to have to be working with your event steward and your fee steward for space. You are going to have to have some spot in the kitchen or a table set aside specifically for you that you can have sanitized and ready for your produce and foods. And they are going to have to work with you to provide that. Sanitizing solutions are very easy to make. The most common one that you'll find on the internet is, is a bleach water blend. And you'll take two tablespoons of bleach water to one quart of water or a third cup of bleach to one gallon of water. However, with the great invention of steramine, you can avoid bleach altogether. No bleach near the garb. And that is the way that I would go with this. Steramine is, it's a cost option. It's $15. You can get it on Amazon. You get 150 tablets. That's 150 gallons of steramine, one tablet per gallon. You can keep the sanitizer there at the water bearing station with you and use it to sanitize as you are working. Um, I really recommend the steramine method. It's just much easier and it's got less of an intrusive taste from what I understand than bleach water. When it comes to your foods, you're going to have to clean your fruits and vegetables properly. Make sure your hands are clean first and then you rinse any fresh fruits or vegetables before you cut them. You rub them while you hold it, or are holding them under plain running water. The FDA does not necessarily recommend using soap or sterilizing solution or anything like that on fruits and vegetables. Plain, cool water is just fine. You rinse your fruits and vegetables before you cut them so that dirt and bacteria aren't transferred from the knife onto the fruits and vegetables. If something's concerning you or you want to give it an extra scrub, use a clean vegetable brush on firm produce. For cross-contamination, you cannot allow for cross-contamination of possible allergens. I have found more people in the SCA who are allergic to citrus than I ever believed was possible. You do not want to make anyone sick by cutting your oranges and then using the same knife to cut pickles without cleaning that knife and sterilizing it first. You want to wash and sanitize all of your tools between uses, the cutting boards, the knives, your hands, everything. You want to avoid having items that have contracted, contacted citrus fruits come into contact with non-citrus food items. One of the things a lot of people don't think about are food safe temperatures when it comes to water bearing. We usually use things such as oranges, pickles, olives, pretzels, a Chex Mix, and cheese. And everybody can automatically assume, well, of course we're going to keep the cheese cool. Cheese in the summer sun is nasty. But we need to keep food safety in mind when you're setting up a water bearing station. The oranges and the pickles came to you at room temperature. But once they've been opened and cut, you need to be aware that those foods have become exposed to the outside air and the possibility of picking up and growing bacteria. So you have to keep them at food safe temperatures. And this is where my job came in. I spoke with my job trainer at work and according to Air Force guidelines, cold perishable food items should be kept at 41 degrees or cooler and should not be allowed to exceed safe levels for more than two hours at room temperature. 
in Onsteora under a pavilion, that time is cut to one hour. So you want to keep your cut fruits, your cheeses, your pickles, your olives. You want to keep those cool. Either having them sitting in an ice bath or having them kept in coolers when they're not being taken around is one way of ensuring that, that your perishable food items stay cool when not being actively served. One of the things that I had seen online were ice baths for sale, which were basically long tubs, half filled with ice, and then bowls of perishable food set inside of them. Somebody used an inflatable kiddie pool and filled it full of ice and had their food sitting inside of that. That is an option as long as you're covering the top of the food as well whenever it's not in use. In the past, we've all reached into a bowl to grab a slice of orange or a pickle. Um, I know from personal experience, the olives are my weakness. And every time the olives come around, I've got to grab two or three from a passing platter. We've got pretzels, we've got Chex Mix. Those are common sites around the tournament field, but that was all pre-coronavirus. These new methods of delivering these services to the, need to be considered and adopted by the populace. I now put forth that volunteers for water bearing use tongs or serving spoons specifically dedicated to each food item and hand food to the person who is asking for it. Each tong needs to be, again, dedicated to that food item. You can't have the tongs for the oranges go with olives for a trip or go with the pickles for a trip. Um, it's just, again, cross-contaminating your food sources and you're, you're asking for trouble. At my job, any server that might come into physical contact with the food is required to wear non-latex gloves. And I am proposing that our volunteers consider using the same food methods while serving not just whenever you're preparing the food, but whenever you're actually walking around the field, having a pair of gloves on keeps your hands and your germs from getting into the food. And again, each bowl or platter and each set of serving spoons or tongs should be used only for that food item. Gloves, if we're wearing them, they need to be changed if you were handling a new food item or anytime they become dirty or torn. At my job, we have a salad bar that is served to the airmen and the staff member who is serving it wears gloves for each customer. Um, it's just a, another level of safety <clears throat> whenever it comes to food that we haven't thought about in the past. Masks, this is another area of concern that we need to consider. Um, above all, we should follow the recommendations of the Kingdom and Society and any mundane authorities. But as an added layer of safety, masks should be used where appropriate and food handling is one of those areas. Masks benefit the people around the wearer much more than the wearer themselves. If you are asymptomatic, that mask is not protecting you from the people around you. It's protecting them from you. You are preventing your germs from getting on things as much as you are preventing other people's germs from contaminating that bowl of pickles by not letting them reach in and grab their own. I know masks are a hot topic and a lot of people are going to argue them. But if you've ever been out in the hot sun and had the sun beat down on you and caught one of those sun sneezes, you're going to realize exactly how helpful that mask is going to be whenever you catch a sneeze. And we've talked about food. What about hydration? When it comes to drinks, things are going to become 
uh, I say I said a little more complicated on this. I think it's going to become a lot more complicated <laughs> as we try to figure out how to do it. Uh, the days of squirt bottles are coming to an end, or they're going to need to be reevaluated for safety. Overall, the SCA did remarkably well with sanitizing and keeping the populace healthy all of these years. But even prior to the coronavirus, there were just too many diseases and illnesses that could be transmitted with a squirt bottle method. We cannot allow our naivety to be our downfall on this. I'm proposing or suggesting that water bearing should have dedicated coolers for water and Gatorade as, as always. But now instead of squirt bottles, having pitchers with lids for those free roaming water bearers will have more safety than the squirt bottles we used to use. The water bearers who are free roaming can very easily fill their pitcher up, put the lid on it, and go and pour drinks into mugs and cups and goblets with a lot more safety than the squirt bottle method. Our water bearers need to be focusing on cleanliness and contamination as well as keeping the populace hydrated. Rather than having the coolers with drinks open and easily accessible to the populace, I propose that you have a responsible person stationed at the water bearing point ready and capable of taking care of the sanitation and the of the equipment that we use. This is going to require more staffing for water bearing because you're going to have to have somebody at the water bearing point at all times. If somebody comes up to the water bearing point with a mug and they ask for some Gatorade, the water bearer can fill the mug with no problems without touching the mug to the spigot of the cooler if at all possible. This goes a long way in preventing cross-contamination of germs. However, between each mug, it would be well advised that the water bearer wipe down the spigot with a cloth soaked in steramine or the bleach water solution that I said we could have sitting there on our table. They can dry the spigot then with a clean dry rag dedicated specifically for that purpose so that the next mug avoids getting a dose of sanitizing solution with their drink. And it's, it's a little more time consuming but for safety and for taste, your populace is going to thank you if you can give it a quick wipe, swipe. That's all it takes. It, you don't have to scrub. You don't have to rub for 30 seconds. Just a quick wipe and then a swipe with a dry towel. Our future lies with our children, our youth. And the children have always been a big part of any water bearing point. We want to keep them involved, but it's important to keep in mind the potential issues that we're dealing with. Children are not as mindful of sterilization and keeping hands clean and washed. Whoever is running water bearing is going to have to be the person who is taking on that duty to make sure those kids are using hand sanitizer frequently or going to the restrooms and washing their hands and keeping themselves clean. And I encourage everyone to keep this in mind when you're working with child volunteers at Water Bearing Point. Set them up, set up the children with age appropriate tasks, keeping hygiene in mind. It might not be great for the kids to be handling the tongs and the food where they could handle a pitcher a lot easier and go around and pour into cups. Having the kids learn how to sterilize the equipment is an important, important task. The only way they're going to improve their service is if we teach them. I suggest pairing them with a teen or an adult whenever you're talking with one of the younger set and having them carry the pitcher around with the pickle jar, with the pickle, with the pickle bowl, 
have them carry a pitcher of water or Gatorade around with that adult and learn how to do things properly. I'm even willing to work with the MOC, arrange a field trip, invite the children in and have a class on hygiene and safety for whenever it comes to volunteering for water bearing. I do not at any point in time want the children to be kept out of doing this, this task. This is fun for them. They love doing it. But we've got to keep in mind that they are free range grazers. And keeping them out of the food is going to be your number one concern when it comes to the kids, I think. I think our new normal is going to be directed to each of us becoming responsible for e the others, for each other. If you're going to an event, bring your mug. If you're going to the list field, take your mug with you. Allow the volunteers to fill it for you. If you're a marshal, as your fighters are leaving the field, ask if they've been to the water bearing point recently. Remind them to get a drink. If you're a fighter, your marshal's been on the field for five or six rounds. When was the last time they had a drink? Get on them, remind them. And don't forget about the field heralds. They've been raising their voices, announcing each bout. Make sure they are visiting water bearing point as well and getting hydrated. We need to keep everybody hydrated and know that the water bearing volunteers are going to be doing their best to keep everybody safe with the, the coronavirus around. And I think that if we can adopt these new methods, we will find that the transference rate goes down in possibility for us. This may be something we also need to think about whenever it comes to feasts and servers. So this is going to be something that's going to be discussed and brought up probably several times. Um, that is, that is my, my my PDF for you. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to, to help. So I have a couple of questions. Um, and I mean, fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. Very good. I really liked it a lot. And a lot of the things that you said, it's interesting, also are part of my uh, Food Safety 101, which, yes. yeah, it's going to be the same problem for feasts and serving there as well. But um, do you think maybe, and we were just talking about this last night with the marshalate, that we're going to have to have some sort of new training for water bearing to, because like I was thinking about it with the tongs, that's a great idea, but then, you know, they have to know that the tongs can't touch their hands and there's so many things. Maybe we need new training for water bearing. I agree. I agree. Um, I mean, they don't throw our mess attendants at work into the job without three or four days of training. Mm -hmm. I can personally see having classes on how to water bear, how to, how to use yeah, tongs. Yeah. I, I can, I can see that class. Yep. And I think it's a possibility. We used to do exactly that before they disbanded the office. There was someone who was in charge of running classes. You had to be certified to be a water bearer. It was a whole training regimen. Right. But see, the problem right. now is we don't want that liability, but if people get sick in an event, you're going to have that liability, I feel like, anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Most assuredly. There's a lot of... Um, liability as Kat was saying, but we also have to have this service and now that it's unofficial, there has to be some way to get the information out to those people who are wanting to help. And I think 
here I am going to plug it, but King's College is a fantastic place to take this class and present it to anyone. I agree. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I would also, um, Sorsha, it, in part of this is trying to help establish a budget as the groups are making bids, we need to, even though the office is no longer there, if they are going to have the fighting, that type of things, then we need to work the cost of the sanitizer, the tubs, the ice, back into a budget yeah. of some sort. I've got a handout that is designed for autocrats, um, for water bearers to give to autocrats that talks about you know, hey, these are the sorts of things you need to be considering for fighter support um, that I wrote a while back. Um, and it's on the wiki under class handouts. Mm -hmm. One of the good things is that with groups like, let's say Bradley, once we purchase a couple of mixing bowls for pickles and oranges and we have a couple of platters and we buy some tongs, it can be a one-time purchase mm -hmm. and those things can be stored with the Shire belongings um, in the feast gear or whatever the setup is for that particular group um, as long as everybody knows that those are the dedicated water bearing supplies for whoever <laughs> is their volunteer for that particular event. Um, so it, it's it, there's a cost initially in buying the supplies. The group will have to buy the steramine unless somebody just gets generous and donates a bottle. Um, you know, water bearing has a lot. A lot of water bearing comes from volunteering and from donations. You know, I've several times set up for an event, and Kat, you brought bags of oranges. Um, I've had people donate jars of pickles and bags of, ch of pretzels. Um, so, you know, groups may, may rely on, on gifts and donations. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. There is going to be a, a, an initial cost to it, to, to getting it set up correctly. I think, you know, it's really important that people don't get sick. So I think if you go to, you know, whoever's your treasurer or if you're at a baron, you your baron, baroness, your financial committee and say, you know, hey, we need these things to keep people from getting sick. They're probably going to be all in on, on sending the money for that. Yeah. Another thing I thought about, too, was um, you said, you know, to have people bring their mugs, which I'm 100 percent behind. That's what we were going to do when Baronial was going to be one of the first events to limit water bearing after COVID and we ended up just canceling all together. But um, it might not be a bad idea to bring some solo cups or even better if you can get uh, somebody to donate some mugs for newcomers because it never fails when I'm doing it. No. Yeah. Piece that people go, oh, I don't have a mug, and then they need to be able to drink. So. I think the difficulty is going to be the translation point of, hey, Mr. Fighter who just came off the field, where's your mug? Yeah. Because the fighters are not going to want the, the, the delay of filling up a big mug, tracking a big mug. I mean, it almost would make sense to, like, see if we can source some sort of a vendor that makes very small, like, you know, maybe three quarters of a cup content, metal mugs that fighters could wear on their belts and just have, here's my mug, fill it up. Okay, I've had a couple good swallows, I can go do my thing. Because they're not gonna stop and drink a mug that's, yeah. you know. Right, the metal mug on the belt while fighting is problematic in itself. Um, being hit, getting it crushed, somebody else getting hit with it. There's just, there's so much infighting and a lot of things that having a mug on the belt is 
not going to appeal to a majority of your fighters at all. Then how can we get a container to them? For They're years? just going to, have, going to have to buy like solo cups or even the uh, kitchen or bathroom little cups and, yes. you know, have a trash can on our, or a trash bag on our arms as somebody else carrying the cups. It is going to be problematic. There is no one good solution. I don't see that at all. But I think over time, people are going to adjust. It's just going to be that initial time period when they're going to have to be responsible for <laughs> taking care of themselves where, where we've always done that for them. And they all, you know, like Sorsha's uh, presentation said, you know, we have to remind them the heralds have to remind them, you know, the people marshalling have to remind them, we have to all help each other. And, you know, that should be part of, we're going to have to have some kind of new training on all this new normal. And, you know, that's right. part of it. And it's going to be in smaller tournaments, it's going to be easy for them to go over to their pavilion and get their mug and find a water bearer at, and as opposed to like a war or something where the battles are going co consistently and, and heavy. Um, or unless they're in like a bear pit where they're having to go in and out and in and out and in and out real quickly. Um, we're going to have to remind them, you have two minutes to go find your mug and come to the water bearing station or grab a, a youth with a pitcher and go, come with me for a second and, and get me some water and go to your pavilion and get it. And that might be a good way to tie in the event staff, specifically the list mistress, whoever's in charge of how that tournament is being run, make sure that there's specific time periods called out for, okay, it's time for a water break. Yeah, We're stopping all combat, it's time for a water break. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. If we can just remind them, you know, yes, you just came off the field. Yes, you're going to be going back on the field, but you're not going to be going back on for another five or ten minutes. Get a drink. Mm -hmm. If you have time to stand in the sun and talk to the other fighters and joke and talk about that shot you just threw for ten minutes, you have time to do it in front of the water bearing tent. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you so much for the class. I'm going to have to step out. Uh, I've got a an appointment with someone to do a, a wiki consultation. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Not a problem. Thank you, Zabeda. Alrighty, bye-bye. Bye, Zabeda. Bye, Did anybody else have any uh, questions or comments? We have several comments in the chat about, you know, we're going to have to change our culture and group norms to reflect our new normal, which, um, Marguerite agreed with, and I agree as well. Holly yeah, made that the, uh... um, and then Leo Flint said, everyone bring your mug. Yeah, that needs to be in all your event ads and advertisements for sure. Yes. The, the person in charge of water bearing in the past has not been somebody who worked really closely with the event steward. They, right. they tended to just kind of get their stuff together and showed up. This yeah. is going to become more of a working together hands in hand kind of situation where the water bearing coordinator is working with as with the event steward as much as the fighting marshals are and as much as the feast steward is. It's going to become a real job as opposed to just, oh, that volunteer that keeps everybody hydrated and cuts pickles all day. Yeah. Agreed, yeah. Does anybody else have questions or comments? I have a, I have a question. This is Jane. Uh, I haven't done uh, water bearing any time in the last decade. Um, kind of grosses me out the way they used to do it. <laughs> but it worked, <laughs> I guess. Um, is there such a thing as, um, say, if you're volunteering to um, water bear for just one um, activity. Do, 
and you say, oh, well, there's probably going to be 10 to 15 fighters. Uh, is there like a, a spreadsheet or something that says, well, you could probably get away with this much pickles or this much oranges? Is there like, you know, sort of like a shopping list that if I were to gather all the stuff first, chop it, wrap it in plastic, and pack it in uh, a cooler with ice, that I might get away with that? I mean, when you're out, you're out, and that's the end of it, But uh, yeah. which is not ideal. Uh, but is there is there something like that where you think if you're expecting so many people, this is how um, much you buy? Zubeda has a class online. Um, I'll have to look it back up, and I can share it to the group, share the link to the group, um, where she talks about what kind of supplies you're going to need to set up a water burying station. Um, and I don't know if anybody's come up with the magic number of what you're going to need whenever it comes to an event, but you estimate, you know, 80 to 100 people, you're probably going to want at least two, if not three bags of oranges. Um, three or four jars of pickles, you know, um, things, things along that line. I don't know if anybody's come up with the magic, the magic formula yet. We've, we kind of based it off of past experience and, uh, you know, having, having run water burying things before you might, since you haven't run water burying, you might want to volunteer to help with the water bearing so that you can see what goes into it. Sure, before, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, before you before you jump in and, and say, yep, I'll do it, and then realize, oh crap, what have I done? <laughs> I, I noticed that some young lady was volunteering at Braggart's War last year, and she was young, she was all by herself, and it was a shiv activity of some kind. And it looked like a small tournament, but, you know, it was dang hot. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, how is this happening? This is yeah. terrible. And I thought, well, you know, if I had known in advance how many were pre-reg for entering the tournament, you know, it, I might have I might have stepped up if I had known that was going to happen. So I just, you know, I yeah. just thought maybe preparation. Um if there was like a key there, but I guess getting involved, that's the key. <laughs> and, and water bearing will never turn a volunteer away. I have never seen water bearing turn a volunteer away. Um, I have, you know, I've seen people say, well, you know, I volunteered for this activity or that activity, but they, they really didn't seem to need me or they had enough servers. They didn't need any help in the kitchen. I have never seen anybody be turned away from water bearing. We will put a, a squirt, well, in the past, we'd put a squirt, squirt bottle in your hands or a bowl of oranges in your hands and send you out there. Um, and yeah, with, that method kind of grossed me out, which is why I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, hey, you know, I'm looking forward to the future. <laughs> and with things changing, we're going to need to have more staff at Waterbury. You're going to have to have that one person at the table to clean the spigots. Yeah, that one person and, who touches all the things and hands them off, like they do yeah. in the OR. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have that one person there, and then you're going to have to figure, okay, well, that one person can't stay, stay there all day, so you're going to have to have shifts. So you're going to have to have at least two people who will be able to do that throughout the day. And then you're going to have to have your individual volunteers with the pitchers and the serving tongs and the platters to go around and do the job. And you're looking at four to five people there. So water bearing will, n I have never seen anybody turned away from a water bearing station for volunteering. Great, we'll all get on that. My pelican will be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I will find uh, the class that Zubeda, the link that Zubeda sent me and I'll post it to the, uh, to the group and uh, that way you can kind of see what she had set up because she has, her class is geared more towards what do you need to have to set up a water bearing station. Yeah. 
Great. And it, okay. and it gets into specifics that way. All right. um, Thank you. Yeah, and we really need to have a, a class on food safety and feasts. Yeah. I teach it. <laughs> yeah. I, I taught it already for this, but I mean, I'm willing to teach it whenever. Yeah. It covers a lot of the same things you went over, but some of it in more detail. So like, sorry, that was a thought where you're talking about feast. Um, what about pre-prepped items? like pre-cut pickles or pre-cut orange slices? As long as they were cleaned, as long as they're kept cold, mm -hmm. then you can, you can still do pre-prep. Um, you want to keep things cool. And I, one of the arguments that was brought to me was, well, pickles are put into vinegar and they're sterile and they're safe and Olives, I mean, olive, you don't have to refrigerate your olive oil, so why do you have to worry about olives? And people just don't quite grasp the concept of how bacteria grows on food and how fast bacteria grows on food. So, you know, the pickles, once they're out of the jar, yes, they were room temperature, but once that jar was opened, they have been exposed to the bacteria of the outside world and they need to be refrigerated and kept cool. Um, yeah, pre-prep, there's really no problem with pre-prep as long as you're, you know, keeping things cool and keeping things sterilized. Right. Do, do the same thing like if you were preparing a feast. Yeah. As same if you kind were, of, you know, yep. not cross-contamination, all that same sort of thing. And yep. then you'd have it in the cooler, but then I'm just thinking that would, you know, alleviate the, um, the cross contamination while on site, attempting to, yeah, deal with the space issue and all that. Yeah. Filling up your Ziploc bags and throwing them in the cooler. Mm -hmm. Can it be required um, that feast across? To, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Take a food no, safety okay. course. Yeah, so, yeah, somebody just asked in the chat, can it be required that feast across take a food safety class? I, I don't think so. Um, again, it's that whole liability issue, right? If we say you have to take this class to be a feast across, now we're somewhat guaranteeing that yeah. they're going to not get people sick, and we can't do that. You know, we can say it's a lot less likely that they're going to get people sick if they know what they're doing and how to handle the food, but I don't think we can require that. And, and that may be up to each barony and group too. I don't know. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's true. Some uh, sites require that you have a food handler's license to do a feast. And so Holly's comment was, I'm in Lokak and in my area halls with kitchen will. So, and that's true here that I've cooked in sites where they said we had to have it. I think it would cut way down on the number of people volunteering to do feasts as well, simply because their jobs are not conducive to spending the money on a food handler license versus having the time to do it. Right. That's true too. My other thought was, how about um, like households that are potentially going to start doing maybe their own kind of water bearing for their fighters or um, groups that bring their own gods up towards the field? Same. If it's their um, household thing, I mean, the households aren't even recognized by the SCA, so that's right. not liability for the SCA. I mean, yeah. Cool. You, hope that they're still taking precautions, but that's kind of on them and on their group. We have actually bags with all of our names on them in our household. Mm -hmm. And that is your bottle for the day. You refill it or unless you personally ask someone else to or they'll put a new bottle in. But the bags with the names work really well for us. That's a great idea. One of the things that came up after I had put this together um, that also needs to be thought about and addressed are the uh, ever-popular mint rags. 
um, the bucket full of, of cold water with the mint and the washcloths that the fighters like to occasionally throw on their neck. We can't go there anymore. Nope. If you bring your own for you, that's fine. If your household is, if your household is, bring them out and put them down in the water and reuse them. And okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was brought up after I, I put this together, and that's not something that water bearing has ever really been in charge of. No. But that was another thing that I was like, no, nope, we can't do that anymore. You've yeah. got to to be responsible for, for yourself, and we've got to be responsible for each other whenever it comes to this, that we're not passing contagions in any way, shape, or form, if possible. Yeah. Uh, Leo Flynn said the online food handle is, of course, in Texas is $7. And Holly said uh, in LOCAT, it's a free online course. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. We're going to have to get more careful about feasts, about sideboards, luncheons, taverns, anything involving food. Or, you know, water bearing also involves too. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions or comments or thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you, Sorsha, so much. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, thank you. Make sure that this uh, video gets posted. And if you uh, want to post your PowerPoints or want to send them to me to post, either way. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Been great. Bye. 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 Have a good night. Thanks. Pickles. <laughs>